Hello again, rail fans. You know, today's American railroad lines are mostly where they are today because of the way they were planned out in the 1800s. Now, after making a fortune in the express shipping business, Henry B. Plant set out to build a railroad network in the South. He acquired a line called the Atlantic and Gulf that ran from Savannah, Georgia, over to Bainbridge, Georgia on the Flint River. It was built mostly before the Civil War and completed afterward. The A and G fell into foreclosure in 1877, and old Henry was waiting. And with the help of financial backer Morris Jessup, he picked up the Atlantic and Gulf and reorganized it as the Savannah, Florida, and Western. Plant then turned his attention to building routes into Florida. But later, in the 1890s, a chance appeared to link the SF and W to a real Midwestern connection. The Alabama Midland was chartered from Bainbridge, Georgia, over to Montgomery, Alabama. Plant purchased the charter and the railroad and finished the whole thing. The bowline was completed. Now, in the 146 years since, the bowline has risen in, and fallen in the hierarchy of importance, but current owner CSX has something in mind for this mid-19th century route. There are some subtle improvements happening out there. Now, in this video, we're starting at Waycross, which, since it was first put there, has never stopped being a major player on the railroad. Another long train lumbers into Rice Yard at Waycross, Georgia. This is the final few hundred feet of the Fitzgerald subdivision. It was formerly called the B&W Freight Lead. It was part of the old Brunswick and Western Railroad. In a route set up by the train dispatcher, the big freight snakes across Nichols Street and on to the ex-Savannah, Florida, and Western Maine. Now the CSX Thomasville sub and into the busiest hump yard on the CSX system. The train heads into the receiving yard where teams will start separating it into blocks based on where they're going when they depart Waycross. Parts will go on some trains, other parts will go on others. The railroad term is classifying. It's akin to what the Postal Service, UPS, and FedEx call sorting. Rice Yard is where trains end their long journeys and new ones are born. This place should actually be named Rice Yards I counted seven completely separate yards, but I'm sure there's some more. Most impressive is the classification bowl on the very west end of the complex, 64 tracks. After coming into the receiving yard, trains are then pushed over the hump where coupler pins are pulled and as they roll downhill, they're diverted into specific tracks in the bowl. That's the beginning of outbound trains. I'm told a crew hitting it hard can classify 1,150 cars in an eight-hour shift. There's also the north forwarding yard. Only 10 tracks, but the longest is 10,000 feet. Looking from the south side of the complex, there's the south forwarding yard, the diesel repair shop. Behind that is the locomotive service center. To the east lies the spot car repair shop, just one of the shops at Rice Yard, including the giant locomotive back shop, paint shop, heavy repair shop. It goes on. And then there's the locomotive storage yard, a collection of company motive power mothballed here for a dozen or more reasons. Some of these have pulled their last train. Others, like the Dash 8 sent to the Wabtec modernizing program, could be back in revenue service someday soon. In any case, it's pretty dramatic seeing all this horsepower that's been put out to pasture. In the spring of 1971, railroads all over the eastern U.S. were suffering from the bizarre problem of too much business. A.A. Gus Carl was superintendent of terminals for SCL's Waycross Division. He explains how Rice Yard was built to solve that problem. In 71, we reached a point of almost complete, uh, I would call it gridlock. I remember one Sunday in March, 
on the 205 miles of main line from Palatka, Florida to Fitzgerald, Georgia, there was not an open siding, not one. The double track from Folkestone to Jacksonville, the east track was full of set out trains. It wasn't unusual for passenger trains coming south to sit at Folkestone up to two hours trying to fight their way to Jacksonville. The cost in the spring of 71 was atrocious. Overtime, crews on the law, it just went from bad to worse. In early 72, we knew something, in middle management, we knew something was up, but didn't know what. It was really a secret. And I recommended they build six long departure and receiving tracks to take the pressure off the other three yards. And he let me talk about five minutes. He said, no, we're not going to do that. Okay. He said, how would you like to have a state-of-the-art huge hump yard in Waycross, Georgia? Well, I grinned from ear to ear. I thought, that, that's the best thing I'd ever heard. He said, okay, I think I'll take that grin off your face. Mr. Kelly looked at me and he said, we're going to build it over the top of your yard and you're going to continue to operate the yard. <laughs> Fortunately, that announcement was made before lunch because my stomach went just like that. <laughs> These days, outside of Rice Yard is where you have to do your rail fanning. Nichols Street is one of several places that's easy to access and safe for rail fans. You can park well off the road here and be out of the way of things. Unless it's raining, then you're out of luck. This morning, the rain isn't terrible, and the next event was worth the wait. M515 arriving from Nashville, Tennessee. He's coasting down to a stop before the crossing because he's been ordered to wait. He can't get into the yard until this train clears. It's northbound M514, way across to Nashville, the counterpart to M515. I don't know how often train pairs meet on the yard lead here, but it's pretty cool when they do. The 514 is dropping his conductor here to meet the crew bus that's bringing out an EOT, end of train telemetry device. In the trailing position on M514 is this old General Electric AC4400 CW. In the CSX nomenclature, a CW44 AC. Built in 1996 with a 4400 horsepower engine and AC traction motors, this is the model that CSX and Wabtec are updating in a modernization program, though this unit has not yet had that treatment. I always identify these and the Dash 8 class GEs by that radiator that's not as thick as new models, and by the large silver exhaust stack. These engines usually carry a classic Nathan K5 LA horn, almost always covered in soot from being right next to the stack, especially when running backwards puts them downwind of the exhaust. The 514, unlike the 515, is carrying intermodal traffic on the bottom. Three quarters of a mile to the north is a junction called Lang. This is where the former Brunswick and Western from Albany, Georgia, now the Pearson Spur, converges with the Fitzgerald sub for the final approach to Rice Yard. I'm at the Albany Avenue crossing as L743 rolls in. 743 is a bizarre daily train, classified as a local that originates up in Brown Sand, Georgia. Stops in Waycross, Baldwin, and Wildwood traveling over 400 miles before it terminates at Winston, Florida. On this leg of that long trip, the train is loaded with sand and rock. A couple miles farther up on the Fitzgerald, Maine is Jamestown. Routine tire replacement is underway, but this is something you don't see all the time. 
The old concrete tires are being replaced with wooden ones. This sometimes happens because the track starts pumping underneath trains, or aggregates and abrasives from leaky cars works its way under the rails and grinds on the concrete tie. I'm told under certain harsh conditions, wood ties actually hold up better than concrete. This might be such a place. Something else caught my eye at Jamestown. The street running parallel to the track is called ABC Street. Now, I didn't do any research or talk to any locals about this, but when there's a road 25 feet from a track that for 20 years was called the Atlanta, Birmingham, and Coast, A, B, and C for short, that's no coincidence. Anyway, I'm just south of the Jamestown signal, and it's raining again. Back down at Nichols Street, a local is standing on the Rice Yard lead, waiting his turn to get in. At that same moment, here comes a southbound auto rack train with an SD-70 Mac in the lead and its classic ear-splitting horn pressure. He's going straight through to Jacksonville with his loaded auto racks up front and loaded piggybacks on the bottom. I never did get this train symbol. This local has apparently gotten radio permission to come on in the yard. He throttles up to get his cars moving and side by side with the road freight, he rolls on down. minutes later, here's a northbound, throttled up and coming through, it's EO-15, empty coal hoppers out of Palatka, Florida and headed for Evansville, Indiana. Waycross is definitely the centerpiece of the bow line. Next, we'll look at this latest round of expansion on Henry Plant's old railroad. As the bow line leaves Waycross to the west, all those dozens of tracks in Rice Yard finally funnel down at a spot called Ruskin, and the Thomasville sub becomes a single track railroad. Valdosta is the next terminal on the line. There are several dozen industries here, plus interchange traffic with the Norfolk Southern and the short lines Valdosta Railroad and the Georgia and Florida Railroad. Agriculture is the big business around Valdosta. These hoppers full of wood chips are probably going to the PCA paper mill south of here at Clyattville. Next morning I'm up early, and you can't tell it here, but this is Boston, Georgia. It's the first shot of a humid late June morning in South Georgia, after driving 12 miles with the AC blowing hard in the vehicle. When will I ever learn? This is train L732 coming back west from Quitman, Georgia, with interchange traffic off the Georgia and Florida Railroad. Most, if not all, of these cars are out of the big Georgia Pacific paper mill near Perry, Florida. Boston is also a farming community, peanuts, soybeans, and the like. There was passenger service here at one time. The depot is still here, though I think that's a remodel from whenever it was in train service. The building was either moved back from the main line or was built there and had a station siding. Looks like a remnant of that track is still in the ground and in service as a storage track now. Boston also hosts a newly extended 10,000-foot passing siding that's been connected to the positive train control network and upgraded with 25-mile-per-hour turnouts, though they're still manually operated, not dispatcher-controlled or even power-assisted. This is just an electric lock that signals the PTC network when the switch is reversed. 
The word is that CTC signals may be coming to this line, but that's apparently in a later phase. We picked up and moved another 12 miles west to Thomasville. Landing in a residential section, I was quickly reminded that you see the darndest things when rail fanning. This old house apparently had a fire and was left just like it sat right there. Someone's still taking care of the yard though. And right next to that, this. Here, coming out of CSX's Thomasville yard, the Georgia and Florida has a line that runs northward to Camilla and Albany, Georgia. Being an Omnitrack short line, everything GNF carries is interchange traffic. The conductor is on the ground, flagging the crossing. He'll follow the train in his truck, meeting him at switching points along the way. Noteworthy to us is that motive power, ex-Canadian National GP40-2s with snow sheds still over the air intakes, and that third unit, an ex-Boston and Maine GP40-2. I forgot to mention my bowline guide today was Charles Burgess out of Cairo, Georgia. All right, Charles, what are we going to do after we got this GNF train? We're going to grab M202 that's coming through Boston now. We're going to follow him north until he runs into uh, M649, more than likely in Donaldsonville. That's We're still on the bowline, right? Still on the bowline. We're going to check out uh, a sign extension in progress, and we're also going to check out a sign extension that's already been complete. Outside of the old Atlantic Coastline Depot is the switch for the Thomasville Yard lead. It's a radio-controlled remote assembly called a power-assisted switch. The yard job is shoving a loaded grain hopper to the flour's baking plant. Only about three quarters of a mile from the yard, the train got there before we could get there, so I didn't catch them spotting the hopper. Flowers Foods is the giant behind Sunbeam Bread, Nature's Own, and about a thousand other products. Started in 1919, right here in Thomasville, Georgia. Next, we piled back in the truck and headed for another intercept. Hi. All right, Charles, headed to the yard now. Gonna catch us 220? 202. 202. Yes, we're gonna uh, try to make it to the Thomasville Yard Office to grab 202. It's gonna be a pretty tight race. Also on the chase today are Will Newberry up from Tallahassee and Caleb Burgess out of Cairo. Caleb and I are shooting video, Will is shooting stills. We're all set in Thomasville Yard as M202 appears. This is dedicated auto rack traffic from Baldwin, Florida to Louisville, Kentucky. These are empties returning from several places in Florida to loading points in the Midwest. Along the way, this train will stop to work Snowden, Alabama and Gabbettville, Alabama. We broke off from Thomasville and headed farther west to Cairo. Getting to be lunchtime, Charles recommended a local favorite, Mr. Chick. This place is part chicken joint, part roadside museum. Anyone who grew up in the South in the 60s, 70s, or 80s will recognize every artifact they have here. If you love gas station memorabilia of all kinds, don't miss Mr. Chick. Remember when Cokes cost a dime and came out of these machines in glass bottles and were absolutely ice cold? And here's another rarity. Unlike many of today's fast food places, Mr. Chick is ridiculously clean. The floors, the tables, the counters, everything. We all got chicken tenders. It comes with fries and a roll, with a medium drink about 12 bucks. Best chicken I've ever had anywhere. Mr. Chick is right on Highway 84 in Cairo. If you're ever this way, stop in. But build in an extra 20 minutes or so to soak in all the artifacts, especially out back. They have a whole bunch of railroad collectibles. 
45 minutes and we were back on the road pointed west. Just outside of Cairo is something else you don't see every day. At a church called the Family Worship Center is one seriously tall cross. I'm guessing 60 feet or better. This is also worth a stop. Two towns west of Cairo is Climax, so named because it's at the highest point on the line before descending into the Flint River Valley at Bainbridge. For years, Climax has been a 7,811-foot passing siding on the bowline. Now CSX is extending Climax to more than 10,000 feet, installing welded rail and PTC switches. This part of the line is still jointed rail, but the plan is to replace it with continuous welded rail soon. This place will soon be the south end, but for now, this is the actual south end of Climax siding. We sat up here and waited for a meet we'd heard planned out on the radio. It was about half an hour until up came M650. He originates at Rice Yard in Waycross, then works Thomasville, Bainbridge, and Dothan, Alabama on his way to Montgomery. M650 is going in the siding to meet the other half of this train pair, M649. 650's conductor climbs down and opens the switch. then calls out milepost and time to the engineer. AN 717.5 This is information for the switch position awareness form, which crews must fill out and complete any time they operate hand throw switches in non-signaled mainline territory. Before M650 clears the siding at climax, the crew must report this information to the train dispatcher including switch location, time the switch has been restored to normal position and locked, the time the switch was initially reversed, and the name of the employee who operated the switch. The switch position awareness rule was adopted following a 2005 train wreck that occurred in dark territory on the Norfolk Southern in Graniteville, South Carolina, at which a mainline switch had been left reversed. A road freight came through several hours later and slammed into an unoccupied train tied down on the industry track. Graniteville and several other human error train accidents are what drove the push for PTC. As M650 glides into Climax siding, his southbound counterpart, M649, is coming up the hill out of the Flint River Valley at Bainbridge. 650's crew has left the switch reversed for the siding, but that's okay. With the two trains stopped side by side, M649's conductor has walked up to the switch and is getting the gate in railroad slang. I'm not exactly sure why they did it this way, but it was mutually agreed upon in advance. Also, as to why the 649 engineer stopped so far back from the switch, I can only guess that it has something to do with the PTC system and avoiding some penalty the software imposes if you pull too close to a misaligned switch. Again, it's only a guess. In a few more minutes, 649 is on his way to Thomasville and then to Waycross. The bow line is being upgraded because either of its value as a bridge route or because CSX has some other plan in the pipeline. We'll just have to wait and see on that one. But since they sold off the seaboard Savannah to Montgomery line and their Jacksonville to Pensacola line, the bow line and the old A, B, and C are the only east-west routes across Florida and Georgia. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. A couple of thank yous here. First. Uh, shout out to my son Robert Harmon for the new hat emblazoned with the distant signal logo on it very stylish very much appreciated I really like this one I think this is going to work really well 
plus the old Key West milepost zero hat. Liz says it was beginning to smell a little bit, so maybe it was time to uh, hang that one up anyway. Now send me your remarks in the comment section down below. I read them all and I try to reply to as many as I can. Hit the like button if you like this video, that's uh, important too, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done that. And let's try to meet up again somewhere soon, somewhere out there on the high iron. And until we do, this is Danny Harmon.